any conversation about movement in any learning context, whether it be a classroom or whether it be a corporate training setting, needs to begin with the brain-body connection. The more you know about it, the more you can influence it, rather than it just running your life all the time. Let me give you a couple of examples. Biomedical researchers now know that cortisol, which is a powerful hormonal byproduct of stress, is also a powerful immune cell inhibitor. Uh, what does that mean? In our modern culture, we keep the accelerator down too long. The danger flag has risen uh, too often. We live in periods of chronic stress, and we can get what? Sick. Yeah. So what's stress? Stress is a perception of an event that happened, that's happening, that might happen. What's a perception? It's a thought. So we can link our thoughts to illness. Deepak Chopra says it best. Our immune system is constantly eavesdropping on our inner dialogue. But when's the last time your doctor asked about what you were thinking? That's not very practical. More often they're asking about your stress levels, which is the same thing. Conversely, it was thought up until about three decades ago that the brain cells, or more specifically the nerve cells and neurons you were born with, the less than 100 billion is all you got. We now know that that's not true, that in the hippocampus region of the brain, we can in fact create new nerve cells, and the process is called neurogenesis. Now when I ask audiences how they think this happens, they'll say things like crosswords or reading, keeping your brain sharp through games, and the answer is actually aerobic activity. The big picture is this. What we know now is that the brain is one of the primary beneficiaries of the benefits of aerobic activity. And it does far more than neurogenesis. But when's the last time your personal trainer said, what cognitive function can we enhance today? Well, that question doesn't happen very often either, but I hope it will in the future. So the reason that we talk about the brain-body connection are several. Number one, it matters what you think. Number two, it matters what you do. And number three, I want you to understand that learning does not happen from the neck up. It happens from the feet up. And the brain-body connection will also serve as an underlying fundamental for a framework I want to share with you about using movement in six different ways, purposely and thoughtfully in almost any learning situation. Step number one in this framework is preparing the brain to learn. Now that you know a little bit more about the brain-body connection, you can also understand how physical movement can help the brain reorganize itself. The research is young, but it is very promising, especially in the area of reading. Many of the activities are quite complex. Some require equipment, but there's one that I can do with you right now, sitting in your seats. So I'm gonna ask everybody to grab your nose, doesn't matter what hand it is. And I'd like you to cross over and grab your opposite ear. And in a moment, I'm gonna ask you to switch. So this ear hand goes to the nose, and the nose hand goes to the opposite ear, just like that. Ready? Switch. 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 All right, shake it out. If you ended up like this, or like this, that wasn't quite right, but you did great. Step two in the framework is kind of the pop culture face of movement, providing brain breaks. You're 30, 40 minutes into a lesson, and attention has withdrawn, boredom has risen, blood has pooled in the butt and legs, it just happens. The brain says, hey, you've been sitting for a while. You must be sleepy. And it does a little brain chemical dance to make you sleepier. So there's all these reasons to manage the brain, body, emotional states of your learners by getting them up and moving. So if you would, please, stand at your seats. And I'd ask you to be silly with me for a few moments. I'm going to ask you to use the top of your head as a writing utensil in the air. And you're going to write the name of your mother. Cursive or print, doesn't matter, just like this. <laughs> go ahead, go.
Now, with your right elbow, I want you to write the name of your father. With your left elbow, I'd like you to write the name of your best friend. And this is really funny because some of you are still thinking, folks, <laughs> nobody's going to know. <laughs> you, can, <laughs> you can write Brad Pitt. It's OK. Now, this is where it gets fun. You've won all expenses paid vacation anywhere in the world you want to go for two weeks with your right hip. I'd like you to write that. You're doing great. <laughs> Mine has two dots. <laughs> Last one, with your left hip, I'd like you to write whatever meal it is you'd have on this trip. It's free, there's no calories. What would it be? What would you have every day? And now, thank you very much, and I'd have you take a seat. Now, I hope you can feel it. I have a more efficient, effective learner in front of me who's now ready for more content. It will fade. It will fade, and that's about being a great state manager. That's about being a facilitator of learning and a designer of the learning environment versus just a teacher. Not just a teacher, but beyond. So brain breaks are very important. Step three in the framework is supporting exercise and fitness. My partner in creating this framework is a Dynamo Health and PE teacher in northern Pennsylvania. Her name's Tracy Langel. And we went back and forth about including this in the framework. Because whether you're a teacher or a trainer, you don't have a lot of uh, influence over the fitness levels of your learners. But two things swayed us. Now, I'm going to get my hand slapped for this. I should say that research suggests there might be a correlation. Folks, listen. Kids who are physically fit do better academically. Kids who are physically fit do better academically, and aerobic activity enhances brain function, even in the short term. The research on this is growing, and they also show up to school more. There are also fewer discipline problems. It is very, very promising. The current conversation in education is about the common core. It is about teacher evaluation. It's about assessment. For me, the 10,000 pound gorilla in the room that most people are not even aware of is this relationship between physical fitness, aerobic activity, and academic achievement. And to continue to ignore it is to the great detriment of the academic lives of our children. It is my hope that one day the physical educator and the physical education curriculum gets the same amount of respect that the math and language arts curriculum gets. Because I know and understand what this does for this. To borrow from my good friend, Gene Blades Moyes, thank you, I agree. <laughs> to borrow from my good friend, Gene Blades Moyes, we live in a culture of sitness versus fitness. And we're literally shriveling our brains because of it. Okay, I'll get off my soapbox. The other reason is simple, another statistic. One in three kids born in the United States in the year 2000 will develop diabetes. That is shocking and simply unacceptable. So there are activities you can do in the classroom that are three to five minutes long that begin the process, start to help kids realize that physical fitness is important to their academic life and to their life in general. It's better if it's systemic within a school building or a school district, but it can start in the classroom. Step four in the framework is creating class cohesion or team building. Research also tells us that when you create relationships between students and you create relationships between students and teachers, academic achievement rises. It is about creating a safe home for the mind a safe home for the mind where a child feels like they belong. A safe home for the mind where a child feels like they can be wrong. A safe home for the mind where a child is free to take a risk because everything in a classroom represents a risk at different levels to every 
different child. The greatest challenge a teacher has every day is not implementation of Common Core, it's not implementation of assessment, it's not teacher evaluation, it is student motivation. When you combine ability and effort with a manageable task or risk, you create the perceived opportunity for success, and that is the key to motivation. And there are many ways to create this environment, this emotionally safe environment that stimulates intellectual achievement through movement. It's not the only way to do it, of course not, but there are many, many ways to do it. It's not practical for us to do any of that here today. Just know that movement can be very um, helpful in creating teamwork, creating communication, an environment in the classroom that allows for success. Step five in the framework is reviewing content using movement. And I'd like to show you an activity right now. So if you'd please stand at your seats. I'm going to ask you one multiple choice question. And I'd like you to answer me physically. If the answer is A, I would like you to simply walk in place. Do that with me. Great. If the answer is B, I'd like you to touch the opposite knee. If the answer is C, I'd like you to do an upper body jumping jack. I'm just going to wave our arms. If the answer is D, I'd like you to do the nose ear thing. So let's review. A, B, C, and D. Don't answer until I say go. I want you to hear all four options first. Here's your question. Which one of these individuals was not a US president? Was it A, George Washington? That's not right. B, Thomas Jefferson, C, Alexander Hamilton, or D, Martin Van Buren? Go. If you said C, Alexander Hamilton, you'd be correct. First Secretary of the Treasury never ascended to the presidency. You may have a seat. Thank you. Why is this so effective? Well, there's many reasons. Number one, students get a brain break without taking a brain break. We're doing something academic. Number two, it's safe. If you don't have the right answer, you can look around the room and change, and it's okay. I saw plenty of you doing this. Oh, yeah. Number three, everyone's engaged. How many of us in this room have been in a scenario where a teacher asks a question of a class? Now say, who's the second president of the United States? Four kids raise their hand, the same four kids, and she calls on Johnny, and he's right, Thomas Jefferson, and the rest of the kids say, whoo, glad she didn't call on me. Kids retrieve, store, and learn information at different rates, and we need to be respectful of that, and this is one way to do it. Also, it's a great assessment tool. You know, we're not very high up Bloom's taxonomy. We're recalling simple information. But how often does a teacher get to see what their entire room knows at one time? Often we have to somehow have some kind of assessment tool, which takes us a while to get through to understand. Now I know I need to go back over the fact tomorrow that Alexander Hamilton, again, never ascended to the presidency. So it gives me quick information. Is this always appropriate? No, it's not, but it's sometimes appropriate. Step six in the framework is teaching content using movement. It is my favorite thing, and it's only limited by your imagination. Whether it's having kids come up here and stand in a circle and having one more child walk around the circle and count their steps, then walk through the circle and count their steps, and you've got the relationship between circumference and diameter. I took it out of the workbook, I took it off the PowerPoint, you know, away from the worksheet and made it real and three-dimensional. Or kids who are learning their cardinal direction, little guys, and you read a story that has north, south, east, west in it. When they hear north, they move forward. When they hear south, they move south. 
so on and so forth. It doesn't matter if it's kindergarten or it's high school physics. Teaching content using movement differentiates instruction for kinesthetic learners. It takes advantage of episodic or environmental memory. It makes learning implicit, the brain's preferred way to learn. Most school learning happens explicitly. And it's not that these two don't work together, they do. But reading, writing, listening, discussion, it's all explicit. And it's not as easy for the brain to do versus doing or feeling. That's the brain's preferred way to learn. So when you create a kinesthetic classroom, the byproduct naturally is a motivated learner, an engaged learner, higher academic achievement, and students who most of the time are happy to take place, do the work they need to do in the classroom. Thank you very much.